to the Let's Talk Paralegal podcast. We chatted a little bit before the recording, and I'm super excited about the topics that we're going to go over today. I think it's going to be very beneficial for the audience, especially to grasp that information from you, quick and concise. Um, so if you want to give a quick little recap of who you are and what you have to offer and your 10 years plus of experience um, that you bring to the legal industry, and thank you for that, because we definitely need um, those soldiers in the industry, especially now with everything that's happening. So go ahead. The floor is yours. Absolutely. Well, I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. So the entertainment capital of the country. Mm -hmm. Love it here. I've been in the legal industry since 2012. It was a fluke. I never intended. I was always in the entertainment industry. Oh, but, wow. you know, life just has a way of moving you in directions that you never thought you should be in. And then all of a sudden things click and everything works out. So I entered the legal industry through mediation. Somehow various female attorneys were coming to me um, and saying, Judy, you have a really good personality for mediation. You should consider it. And I didn't. And I didn't. And the third time somebody said it, I said, so maybe I should ask why and what this is and how to deal with it. And the third person who said this to me was the woman I bought my company from, Divorce Resource Incorporated. She had owned it for a million years. She was kind of waning down, you know, almost ready to retire, but she got ill. So after I got some mediation training from the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office, which was phenomenal mediation training, she needed to go out for an operation. And I said, well, I'll come in and I can deal with your clients because I had been renting an office in her suite for about a year, just listening and paying attention to what she was doing. I was mediating all sorts of cases, not just family law, which is what I'm in right now. Just a variety of things. I got to know how attorneys worked. I got to know how they build. Um, I demystified the uh, the fear around attorneys because I started mediating attorney-client fee disputes for the Los Angeles County Bar Association. And that was a strategic move on my part, literally to get to understand how attorneys worked. I thought that was really important and then to showcase Absolutely. myself. And those yeah. are tough mediations. When, when clients are disputing a fee from an attorney, it's kind of on an unequal footing because they didn't really know the law, but they know when something isn't right. They know when they feel like they've been overbilled or why did we have to go to court? That seemed to be so unnecessary. So hmm. the public, they don't, they maybe don't know the law, but they know the service that they expect and they can see results. So I thought that was a really important step. I'm in the office of the woman who used to own this company and then she had to go out for an operation. So I paid enough attention and said, you have a great secretary who's banging out all the forms, love her. I can meet with your clients. You know, she was younger and I was older and you need, at least for mediation, a little bit more experience, a few lines on the face because people need that life experience to feel comfortable in mediation. If you're dealing with people who are getting divorced, especially maybe people who've been married 15 years or so. Hmm. She was the paralegal though. She was the one that was licensed as a legal document preparation company in the state of California. In order to in order to provide a service that's a standalone service working directly with the public, you mm -hmm. can't just be a paralegal. It's not allowed. You can be a paralegal to attorneys, like you are to attorneys, but you can't be a paralegal to the public. You have to get an additional bond and license as a legal document preparation company, and then you can work directly with the public in two areas of law only, family law and bankruptcy. So I deal primarily or strictly in family law. I don't do anything in bankruptcy, but I know enough about bankruptcy that if we have, if we have a client and I deal with both spouses in an amicable situation, 
that is completely in the red and they have children and now you have spousal support and child support coming up, how are they going to pay it? Well, one of the options is to declare bankruptcy before you really get into the divorce filing so that you can clear away a lot of the debt. So now you have a different profit loss profile from which to enter the divorce arena and to negotiate child support and spousal support. So I have to know enough about bankruptcy. I also have to know enough about immigration because questions come up. I can't talk immigration law, but when, you know, we're one of the immigration capitals of the United States, as is Florida, as is South Florida specifically. And so you really do have to be conversant with immigration a little bit. You have to know about the importance of that two-year mark. And if you're getting divorced before the two-year mark versus after, you have to be conversant in what is your obligation as a U.S. citizen. If you've brought a foreign national into the country, you have to be uh, understanding about spousal support. It's minimal what you have to do, but there's X number of years that you have to make sure the foreign national isn't living below the poverty line or you have to make up for it. And the, and, and the reason for that is, and I, you, I don't know if, if you, if, if the audience knows this or not, because it's very specialized, but the government does not want foreign nationals living off the government, if at all possible. That's why there's a stipulation that the sponsor, the US citizen, has to be aware of, I think it's 10 years, don't quote me on that, but I think it's about 10 years, that you have to be available to supplement the foreign national with below poverty, at least to the poverty line. So right. conversant in those adjacent areas of law to family law, um, but I work with both spouses generally, that want to be amicable, that don't want to go to court. We file in court, obviously, you know, you have to file in court, but they don't go to court for hearings. If I'm only working with one spouse because the other spouse has hired an attorney, there are other things I'm engaged in, like uh, requests for order. There will, there will be specialized hearings that the person I'm working with will probably have to attend or initiate in order to get the court to make at least temporary, immediate um, awards for child support, spousal support, custody, visitation, before the whole settlement agreement can be fleshed out. So when I'm only working with one person, that's where I deviate out of no hearings to, yes, there are a few hearings that will probably be scheduled. I do a little trial prep. Um, I've done a few, but because I try and work in the amicable idea, trials don't come up with the clients that I work with if I'm working with both spouses. Right. Especially if you're doing mediation though, right? Because mediation and, um, you know, it's trying to prevent you the from trial. going to trial. So Absolutely. that's kind of counterintuitive. And and I love mediation more than, more than you know. I love mediation because it's creative problem solving. I love it because I get to show people if they change the way they communicate, they will be heard in a way that they have not been heard before. And then you have a much better chance of working out the settlement. When you go to court, as, as I'm sure everybody realizes, <laughs> so the judge makes the decisions for you. That's the way it is. And some people have to go to court. Mm -hmm. You know, some people can't even get into mediation. They don't have the communication skills. They may not have mm -hmm. gone through the emotional divorce process first before oh they enter the legal arena. And that's extremely important. If anybody listening brings their clients to mediation or are attorneys who also do mediation, you have to make sure these people have gone through the emotional divorce to some extent, have mm. processed if there was adultery, have processed mm. if there's no money, there was financial malfeasance, mm. um, have pro processed what we call to hot new topic, romance fraud. Huh. 
romance fraud leading into financial exploitation. That's oh, something that's okay. becoming more and more a discussion in California. I haven't thought about that, but that kind of circles back to your mission, right? Because you were talking about um, before the recording, we were talking about your new mission and how that ties in with, um, I guess, this new chapter of yours. So you want to tell the audience a little bit about that? Right. Well, after working in family law for 10 years, I had seen things that attorneys did that made me so sad and upset mm. because it was unnecessary. J things that just um, were billable hours only that had no logic or sense and right. that really caused the other party harm. And I started really on the list serve. So I belong to several bar associations and we all have list serves and you see uh, attorneys talking to one another. And that's great because I get to learn when I'm on the list serves. I also started going to a lot of seminars over the years so that I could learn. I need to learn the law. I can't really give counsel. It's not what we're licensed to do, but I need to know the law in order to mediate. So I know when we're going to a drift and right. <laughs> or it would not accept it in a settlement agreement. So I started looking at things that attorneys were doing that would brand them as untrustworthy and dishonest. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. legal professionals, lawyers are not looked at as trustworthy and honest. And I did a little research online and I looked at this um, um, uh, careers by, by level of trust, out of 15, lawyers are number 12, number one being the best. Number 15 is Congress. Attorney no steps up from Congress. <laughs> Our Congress are the least trusted. Nurses are the most trusted. Yeah. So, I, so well, I we would hope. <laughs> we would hope we have trust in our nurses. <laughs> nurses are more trusted than doctors. Wow. Yes, they, they, they appeared higher than doctors. So, so this is interesting. So let me give you two examples and, and, and why my new mission is to help attorneys understand the importance of acting as ethically and honest as possible and not making money primary to the way they work. Money has to be secondary. In business, I don't care what business you're in, if you make the work that you're doing primary and the money that you make secondary, you'll always make money because you will always get referrals. And aren't referrals word of mouth the best? The best. Uh, well, yeah, it's how you uh, it's it's the best advertisement, right, is what they say. So, yeah. you know, and you'll get more trust through and you'll get better clientele, really, to be frank with you. Excellent point. That is an excellent <laughs> point. And I hadn't even thought about it like that. So yeah. yes, you will get better clientele. You will get clientele that doesn't want to manipulate the system and has the money to do it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So let me give you two, two quick stories. The first one. <laughs> I love stories. <laughs> you know that this one is not good, but it's oh, very no. <laughs> shocking. It's very shocking. So I was at an evening seminar event for the Beverly Hills Bar Association several years ago. These are really great events. You sit at these small tables of eight, so you get to know different people, you know, so it's great for that. You get to network. The food is delicious. So you dine and then you have the presentation. So I'm okay. sitting by myself. I didn't go with anybody to this particular seminar. And to my left are two people, both solo practitioner attorneys, and they've been in business for a long time. Yeah. The female attorney says to the male attorney, you know, I got this great new case in today. Great new case for a lot of money. Code for this is going to be a lot of money. Okay, that's fine. You know, no, there's no, no reason why you shouldn't make a lot of money but it's what followed that defined making money. What followed hmm. was, and I just heard from opposing counsel today, who said, get ready, we're going to paper you to death. 
Okay, thank you. You gave the exact right reaction. You know, uh, exactly. I mean, I had to like, I'm unmuting myself so you don't hear all the background noise that's going on here. But um, let's, okay, wow. I need a second to digest that. That's what? No. Yes. Unbelievable. So the female attorney who was telling the story is representing the wife. Opposing counsel, the male attorney on the phone that she's relaying, is representing the husband. Apparently, he's wealthy. So he can afford the hourly rate and the extra work that will not be necessary in papering you to death. I can't with, are you, this was an actual, okay, wow. I'm sitting, <laughs> and I'm sitting three inches away from these people at this small table of eight. Do they know who you were though? Not no, at all. Right? So, okay. so she says that and nothing is spoken for the next three seconds. And I was waiting for her yeah. to say something. And so I said, look, I'm sorry. I, I, I di didn't mean to eavesdrop it. I'm sitting right here. Right. And I found your story fascinating. Would you mind saying how you responded to that attorney? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, nothing. What should I have said? And I said, well, you should have said it's unethical. It's against the attorney, attorney code of ethics. Uh, ethics you yeah. are literally telling me I'm going to be making money by having my client tortured and I'm supposed to be okay with that. Right. And are you not being paid to defend this person? I can't. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so many things to say about that that I'm just going <laughs> to. Yes. And, wow. and so I said, look, I'm not an attorney. I'm a legal document preparation company and a mediator. The reason why we exist, legal document preparation companies, is because of the story you just told. Absolutely. Completely unnecessary filing, tying up the court's time, um, causing the other spouse hardship, pain, divorce is hard enough. And right. now because there's money there and one attorney is salivating over it um, and telling the oh. other attorney they should like that, and accept that? No, no, no. And 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 I said, wow. oh, I'm sorry that 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 really saddens me, and that's all I'm going to say. And then the right. seminars, and then the seminar started. Wow, that's you know, and I don't want to paint this picture that all attorneys are like this because I I work with not. wonderful attorneys. I've been a paralegal for 18 years, and thankfully, I did not have uh, to work with an attorney, what I call a greedy attorney. Um, I've never had to work with them. I've worked with the hard worker, the one that, you know, stays up until midnight to make sure that everything is where it needs to be uh, for trials. And, and, and even in the capacity that I'm at right now, I still do that. I pick and choose who I work with. I, I do my background checks with them and I make sure that their, you know, their ethics are where they need to be because I don't want my name or nor my business, especially um, tied into something that should not be tied into just because I decided to take on a project, right? You, I'll pay the price eventually. And the legal industry is so small. I think we forget about that, that the legal industry is, it, it looks like this massive monster. Um, but everybody knows, eventually everybody knows everybody or knows of that person. And then you create this reputation, whether it's good or bad. I mean, obviously that's up to you you to to right. make that decision and I don't think that um people think it through when they make decisions or when they send something in writing like that right um it's in writing there's no you know what are you going to dispute right now <laughs> I'm sure all my e my e-discovery specialists are like oh yeah I got a couple ways to like you know amplify that conversation <laughs> yes but you know what Ida there's 1.3 attorneys in the United States. Okay. I just had to do some research. So there's 1.3, this is as of last year, 1.3 attorneys in the United States and you divide that by 50 states, kind of. It, it's uneven, but okay. So <laughs> not everybody's going to need an attorney in their life, mm -hmm. but many people do for many different reasons, either mm -hmm. transactional because you, know, you, you have business and you just need that done correctly or to right. litigate in, in various areas of law. Right. It doesn't take much for those people who cross the line and make money the most important thing mm. to cast a bad reputation on the industry itself. 
Absolutely. I mean, this is the point of the podcast, right? To highlight yeah. the good. <laughs> That's right. And so you have to remember that. And when I, so here's another, here's another story in terms okay. of the attorney model. So it doesn't okay. take many bad apples, so to speak, to cast the aspersion on the industry, untrustworthy, dishonest. Oh, I know what I, I forgot what I was going to say next about that before I go into this other story. Um, and then I, I just lost my thought. Wait a minute, because this was actually important. It doesn't take much bad apples to cast aspersions on the industry and ah, when you are in a tough case mm. and you feel you're very litigious or you're scared and you know it's going to have to go to court and you don't trust the other side, this is the public's fault now. So let's look at both sides of the coin and how attorneys have to monitor this. What does the public say? I want a shark. I want somebody that's going to eat the other attorney alive. Mm. You know, you hear things like that. Well, okay. maybe in this story that I just told you from the Beverly Hills bar, maybe that's how that uh, husband transcribed, right. uh, you know, approached the attorney. But what the attorney should have said was, I'm only going to do what's legitimate. I am not going to do this to your wife just because you have money to go around. That is not why I'm here. That mm -hmm. could have been the response from you know, whoever right. you're representing. And so I think this has to be for all attorneys. You have to stand up and just yeah. say no. When you are trying to be engaged through money, you have to say no because mm -hmm. you're ruining it for the other really good attorneys yes. who are there. And I have wonderful relationships like you do with other attorneys. You know, attorneys that say, you don't need an attorney. You're going to be spending too much money. Call Judy. Call yes. Judith. She'll yes. handle the paperwork. You'll have a little mediation. You do not need to pay $450, $600. An hour. hour. Yes. <laughs> Which goes really fast. You right. know, what I charge for a full divorce can get eaten up in four to five hours, hours. of an attorney. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So here's the other story. And th this is where I think attorneys really have to pay attention to mm -hmm. how to use their services so that they can be looked at as trustworthy, honest, client oriented, and get a lot of referrals. Right. When I was going to paralegal school, I think it was back in 2014. When I was going to paralegal school, we had a test question and the test question was on shoplifting. And in the state of California, the code for shoplifting says shoplifting uh, is not enforceable and it doesn't take place unless the person has left the store with the product that they are accused of shoplifting. Oh, okay. So the test question was, Judy, you're a paralegal working for an, uh, an attorney. So this is a real life situation scenario yeah. and you have a client that's accused of shoplifting and how would you counsel them well well the fact pattern around it is wife is having a bridge party tomorrow today she sends her husband out for a case of beans a very specific case of beans for a very specific lunch item for the bridge party he mm -hmm. goes doesn't get that specific type of bean gets another case of beans that she didn't ask for. Mm. He brings them home and she says, uh-uh, you need to go back. You need to exchange these. I, I was serious. I want this one specific kind of beans. So when he went back the next morning, there was a fundraiser that was taking place at the grocery store mm. and the lines were long and he was impatient, even though he had a sales receipt. He went into the customer service line because that's the correct way you return something in that store. And then you get your voucher and you go back and get whatever beans you want. You bring your voucher with the new beans to the cash register and you cash out. Well, he Got was it. impatient, didn't want to wait in line, says, heck, goes to the <laughs> shelf, puts the case of beans down that he had to return and picks up the right case of beans and starts walking out of the store and security stops him. Mm. So if I was going to argue the code, 
well, there's your one point in the fact pattern where you hadn't really left. And then there's mm -hmm. intention, right? There's always mm -hmm. intention within the law. And that wasn't his intention to shoplift. His intention was, I just got to get the right case of beans. I didn't do it right <laughs> yesterday. And we don't have any time left and I have to get out of here. All right. But she put me in a real life situation. And I have yeah. been involved in many businesses throughout my life. So the way I answered it was, okay, here's how I would counsel the attorney. I would say to the attorney, cut, cut the client's losses. Tell the client to write a thousand dollar check to the fundraiser that the grocery store is sponsoring and apologize. And I bet the grocery store accepts it because they have a cost. They have to pay for an attorney. This thing is going to go to trial, trial hearing. And mm -hmm. I think they want out of it too. Nobody wants to have legal issues. They just want to do their business. So mm -hmm. I said, that's the way I would advise the county, re, uh, the attorney, um, letter of apology, thousand dollar check, no more attorney's fees for us. And then hopefully the grocery store will feel the same. She right. failed me on the question. Really? I wrote her back. Just like Cher on Clueless. Remember Cher's father was an attorney and he said, always argue, are, always argue your way out. And she would argue her grades. And I yes. said, no, I'm going to be like Cher and Clueless. But I really was serious about this too. Yes. And I said, look, you put me in a real life situation. I'm old mm -hmm. enough to understand business. And this is where attorneys are not taught business. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are... They land in a law firm and there's the business model and there is billable hours. You have a quota. And if you're not meeting your quota, you have to figure out ways to bill a client. And so you put in unnecessary things. You put in mm -hmm. phone calls, you put in emails, you put in mm -hmm. meetings just so you can reach your quota and it wasn't necessary. So I argued it back though. I said, look, you put me in a real life situation. And in real life, if you really want to build a business built on trust, honesty, and client oriented service, right. you will figure out a real life situation that will cut your client's losses, especially if your client really isn't guilty, it, especially if you could argue the code, well, it didn't really meet the code. The intention wasn't there and he hadn't left the store. Right. She passed me. She gave me the grade back. There you go. <laughs> so this is, she was an attorney. She's a teacher. She was an attorney. And this is where my mission is. I want to change the way the attorneys look at running their business, accepting business, executing business because it needs to be that way. And here's why there's a movement in California and it started at the state bar level last year to create a level of legal service called the para professional. Is it, in, is it in Florida as well? It's not in Florida yet. Um, but Utah, Colorado, Arizona, they're all on the same bandwagon. And I'm hoping that it gets to Florida too, because I think it's a, a it will it will alleviate a lot of the what you were calling where you're talking about, the fluff, unnecessary uh, legal billing that's happening well, now. But see, I'm against the bill. Let me tell you why I'm against okay. it. Okay. And I'm the one and I'm the one that stands to gain. Right. So the reason why I'm against it is because paraprofessionals can give legal advice and can oh, show up okay. in court. That's the way mm. it's written in California. Okay, okay. I think it's a horrible idea for anybody but an attorney to give legal advice. This is what you're going to law school for. Right. You know, this is why you paid 80 to 100 and some thousand dollars and spent many sleepless nights to go to law school. Um, you should only, and then there's the malpractice insurance. This is why mm -hmm. you carry malpractice insurance. I mm -hmm. don't carry malpractice insurance. I don't give legal advice. I don't represent a client. And then to mm -hmm. show up in court, I can understand why to a certain extent, a pro se litigant who has to show up to a hearing, maybe the other side has an attorney and one side can afford it, one side can't, doesn't want it, wants to speak for themselves, but is nervous. But you know what it's like when we're nervous under any situation. We can't find the paperwork we need. You know, we're flustered. It's just the way it is. So mm -hmm. I can understand to a certain extent why somebody 
sitting next to that pro se would be helpful in organizing paperwork, mm -hmm. I still think it's a can of worms that shouldn't, the lid shouldn't come off. I, mm -hmm. I go back to if the attorneys would run a different business model, if the attorneys would stop making those who do money their God, we wouldn't be having this discussion. And the attorneys to a certain extent are outpricing themselves too though. And this is to your point, yeah. maybe you really do need an attorney but you wouldn't need an attorney to keep it quiet, to keep it minimal. You don't really want to go to court. You want to keep it out of court. You just need somebody to speak for you. Maybe that's important in your particular case right. um, because the communication has never been good. I mean, I'm talking about divorce, of course. Right. Um, I can understand that you would need an attorney for that, but oh my God, I know what it takes even to do a simple divorce. <laughs> I mean, you're looking at twenty to forty thousand just for the minimal paperwork for one person. That's right. a lot of money. A lot of people don't have that in their savings. They go into the four hundred one k's, and and so I just think there has to be. Yeah, and if happy. the marriage is of one income, right? You got to think about that too. There's a lot of stay-at-home parents now, and yeah. and you know it makes it harder. Um, I was just talk, having similar conversations about pro bono services and advocacy programs that are out there that a lot of people don't know about. And then when they do find these resources, um, they won't take their case, right? Because they only take particular cases or they're, you know, stretched too thin. So they're unable to take their case at that moment. So, you know, I want to say during my research, you know, the pro se litigants have tripled within the last, I want to say, 24 months. A lot of people are saying it's because of the pandemic and because of the economy and because of the, pre you know, the presidency change and everything that has happened within those 24 months. But it's just economy 101. The economy is due to change and evolve and go down and go up. That's that's what it is. If you look at the course of our economic status, it goes up and down every so often, just like the real estate, just like everything else, you know, goes up and down, just like Wall Street. Right. Um, so it ha I don't think it has, those elements may have a little bit to do with it, but not much, right? Obviously, the the society shut down for a while. A lot of people lost their um, jobs, but everybody's hiring now. So what's going on now, right? What What's the difference between when you didn't have a job and when you can have a job? What What's going on there? And I think it has a lot to do with how people react to certain situations. A lot of people shut down. A lot of people are very angry. A lot of people are depressed. And to your point, um, when you're a pro se litigant, and I think we spoke about this a little bit in the, uh, before the recording, uh, they get emotional about it and they start you know, utilizing these documents as a journal. This is what I call it. It's the best way of, of, of describing a pro se litigant um, document. So to your point, they do need some guidance, right? They need to know the proper formatting, where to send it, how to submit it, how to act accordingly in court, you know, how to address a judge, address a jury, if that's the case. Um, so there are some guidance needed sometimes to the point where maybe a legal document prepper is not able to do that, right? Because right. we're not supposed to cross that line. Right. So I think maybe that's where the organic... Um, paraprofessional or what other states are calling now the legal technicians are now, you know, they're trying to do that because, okay, I prepared this, but now they have all these questions that I'm not able to answer, even though I know the answer, you know what I mean? Right. And I think paralegals go through that as well. You yes. know, we're, we're the constant communicators with the clients, but there's only certain things that we can tell them, That's or right. we would have to say pursuant to attorney so-and-so, yes. you're able to do this, right? But those words are crucial when you are, you know, giving, providing that information to a client. So we often feel like, and I get this joke all the time from like junior associates or, you know, uh, law students. They're like, you probably know more about practicing law than I do. And you never stepped foot in law school, right? Yeah. So, yeah. um, 
It's true to an extent, true. depending well, on yeah. the type of paralegal and the type of paralegal career you've had, right? Because just like attorneys, there's different levels of attorneys. In turn, there's different levels of paralegals. Just because you're a paralegal, it doesn't mean you have the same skills as the paralegal from somewhere else. Absolutely. Um, we all have different set of skills. We all have different experiences, careers, just like, you know, to your point, attorneys. Um, so it, it can be true. And that is quite a possibility. But like anything else, right? Uh, there are, uh, it does um, differ, right? Depending on who you're speaking to. But through this mission, obviously you're really um, doing this for law school, right? Now, that was a great segment. And you're yes. talking about honesty and um, obviously ethics is a, is a main um, topic and it has been throughout this conversation thus far. So um, tell me how that's going for you. Like, cause that for me is really important because law school and even paralegal study programs, they don't teach that. They don't teach you the right. customer experience, customer, right. you know, the client um, satisfaction and how important that is in, yes. in your career, whether you're an attorney, whether you're in legal support staff, that experience is crucial to the success of not only the firm, but of your career and your reputation. So for me, that's super important. And I honed that in in the paralegal studies programs, but I'm excited to hear that you're doing this now in law schools. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I am go I'm going to be delivering this speech to, and I'm, I'm staying in California to start with because I understand all the law in California. Right. I want to speak natural. to law schools because I want to get people before they leave, before they get their internship, before they learn the bad habits <laughs> of forced billing and quotas, before right. they learn all of that. Here. I want to get them and I want to explain what a, what a good business model is like, what a good client relationship is like, and how far honesty will take you. Right. It will make you the most money ever if you are yes. truly honest and you look out for your client first and the bottom line on your firm second because you will make the money. You absolutely right. will make the money. But then that client's want... going to refer you to another client and that client and that client. So absolutely. in turn, you'll get it back. You know, you give forward and then in return, you bring, you get it back. You, you get know, it back tenfolds. and you so. can't pay enough for word of mouth. That is the gold. Right. You want word of mouth bottom line because that will sustain you and sustain you and sustain you. Absolutely. I want to go to bar associations. Yes. Because I want to catch people as they're working. <laughs> and I right. want to say, look, I, I mean, I built this into the speech. I'm your enemy. I don't want to be your enemy. I don't yeah. want to be the paraprofessional that's, you know, starting to gain traction here in California. I want you to be the only ones that quote law, that give legal advice. I am so happy not to give legal advice. I am so happy to say, now that's a question of legal advice. If you don't have an attorney, I have a list I can give you. Right. It, it gives me ultimate pleasure to do that. And right. so I want to at least convert as many attorneys who are already I love it, convert. <laughs> to the other side, the better business side, the side that will let you sleep at night. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and then... I would love to go to law firms because my understanding and re I, part of my research was talking to a variety of attorneys in a variety of areas of law. So right. this is for every area of law in, in California, not just family law, which I'm conversant with. So I wanted to talk to attorneys in different areas of law who actually agree with me. We should not be doing this. And look at what's happening. How do we turn this around? I think you can turn it around. It's not too late. We, we haven't literally secured the paraprofessional yet. And so maybe California at least can be at the forefront of, okay, we get that we have to reevaluate ourselves. We get it. I'm not saying don't make a good hourly rate, make it worth your while. You have ongoing education you have to pay for, those bar fees you have to pay for. Right, all um, the overhead that comes with running a law firm, right? You have to do that, personnel, uh, taxes, you know, all the good, all the nitty gritty that, uh, yeah. again, they don't teach you in law school how to run a right. business, which ultimately that is what a law firm is. Um, it's a business. 
Um, and that's another, you know, thing that they get shocked on. And I think that's where the greed comes. Oh my God, I got to pay all these people. I got to pay all these bills now. And I wasn't expecting that on top. I have this big loan, you know, and on right. top of my head and all these continuing right. legal education and all these memberships and networks and everything that comes with being an attorney. Um, sometimes we lose sight of all that overhead and me as a business owner, I kind of understand a little more right. now versus when I was, you know, working nine to five. So. Right. Exactly. Exactly. No. And, um, you know, the points you brought up are, are really, really good. And, and the one I want to circle back to is it's a business. When I went to my first mediation dinner for Southern California Mediation Association, it was more than 10 years ago. It was probably 13 or 14 years ago. And I was sitting in a preceded the next day, all day um, convention. It was the first time I was literally inside of professionals talking to one another because there were a lot of attorney mediators. And they were saying that this is a practice. A law firm is a practice. It's not a business. And I raised my hand. I said, what are you talking about? Business is merely the exchange of goods and services for money. That's all it is. And that's every right. business. And if you're going to charge for legal services, if you're going to charge for mediation services, you're running a business. Yes. And, and, and the point, the reason why it was brought up was um, the subject was not advertising. It's a no-no for attorneys to advertise. It makes them pedestrian. It makes them less than professional. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, no. You do have to do some advertising. But to the attorney's point, if you, it, 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 because you represent the law, because you work with something that nobody understands unless they're in law, you kind of are holding the golden goose. And there's a lot of responsibility attached to that. So maybe you don't want to do hardcore advertising, but your advertising is the way you treat your clients. Absolutely. That's I, I completely agree. Yeah, that's your advertisement. I, there, you can't buy that type of advertisement. Um, and, and your reputation, you know, going back to um, your own colleagues referring you business. I mean, how how awesome is is that? You know, um, understanding that that is um, an option that your other you know colleagues can do that. You know, can actually provide you with referrals, and in turn, you provide them, and and it's a community. That's what you know. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be a community. We're supposed to work together in order to provide the best outcome possible for these um, clients that are seeking legal assistance with their legal matters. You know what I mean? And and I don't know where that disconnect came from. I don't know if it was just a, a chaoticness or, or, or an, an environment that was created by outside forces. Or, I'm not quite sure where all this um, was birthed from, but uh, I think we lost the, the human factor in the human-to-human -human interaction and the human-to-human -human business aspect. Um, yeah, so well I, I'm put. not quite sure. Well put, well put. So, I agree. but it was a pleasure having you, Judith. Oh my God. We totally went over the hour, but I mean, I can talk to you Did all day. Really? Stuff. Oh my, I wasn't even paying attention to time. I know. No, it's fine. It's fine. I wasn't paying attention until my, my actual earbuds like started going red and I was like, oh wait, it has it, you know, um, but I appreciate everything you, that you're doing for the legal industry. It's just phenomenal and I hope that you this uh section that we were just talking about about you speaking at the law firms and at the young lawyer divisions and all these you know um bar associations I hope this is fruitful for you not only monetary right but it, it creates but the industry the that we're yeah. trying to yeah. do because this is your mission and this is something that the legal industry is in need of right now and I hope that the paraprofessional if it if it means that the paraprofessional, by not passing the paraprofessional bill means that we're going to have better attorneys, affordable access to legal uh, right. assistance, right. 
then right. I'm okay with that too. Then I'm on board with that. But if that's not going to be the return on investment and it's not going to be what it is, then unfortunately, you know, we do need to provide our general public and our, our, um, citizens with affordable, um, good quality uh, access to right. legal assistance. Right. So thank you so much for being on the Let's Talk Paralegal podcast. And I know this is not going to be the end of our relationship. I oh, I, I hope <laughs> not. And let me tell you <clears throat> how much I admire what you're doing with oh, this particular you. podcast and how you're reaching out. Uh, not only do I love the idea, but you're wonderful. You're absolutely wonderful. You have such great energy. Thank you. So positive. <laughs> and um, I would definitely hire you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> absolutely. You're work. amazing. You're amazing. Thank you so much, Judith.